and that's how she will stay, how she will remain. One friend of mine said, how many people watched that funeral, Dan? And I said, 25 million in this country. And he said, well, that means half the country wasn't watching. What the hell are you doing getting so worked up about it? <laughs> a lot of people weren't in the mail and were really not that affected by it. So Princess of Wales never really thought that much of her. Slightly screwy, loopy, odd figure. I don't quite see why we have to venerate her now she's dead. She was a shining spirit who will never be forgotten. The orgy of sentimentality was nauseating to behold. A complete suspension of reality by the British people. She became a sort of Christ-like figure. We thank you this morning for life, Diana, Princess of Wales. I certainly didn't grieve about Diana's death. How can you grieve somebody that you've never met, that you don't know? It's presumptuous and it is, I think, offensive. She'll always be in our thoughts and forever in our hearts. It was like Disney meets the black shirts. You must cry. I couldn't understand what was happening and it frightened me. She's a wonderful person and it's very, very sad. I thought it was chilling and it just seemed to be going on too long and I felt it was about time that it was pointed out that it's our country too. It's still quite difficult to believe what was happening on this very spot this time last year. The surreal events of Diana Week, among other things, altered the whole meaning of this Mao for an entire generation, transforming it from a dignified imperial procession route into a site of raw popular emotion. It's too early, people are fond of saying, to take on board the whole significance of that blazing meteor, or if you must, that brief candle. And of course, nothing could be more British than the belief that something is too soon or premature. Actually, the time is overripe to ask ourselves what was and is the significance of the death of the princess? It was in Paris, capital of the world's first modern republic, that Princess Diana was cruelly and abruptly translated from the banal to the sublime. Having been putting on the Ritz with her jet-set Playboy escort, she got into a car with a hyped-up driver. And after a frantic journey of less than five minutes, her short life was wastefully and pointlessly over. Wasteful, pointless, but meaningless. For millions of people, this accident was no less than a personal trauma. Superficially, the tragedy belongs to the realm of kitsch iconography, like the famous memorial to Jim Morrison in a nearby Paris cemetery. Lives that are cut off too soon, like those of James Dean or JFK, make good iconic material because they can be mourned for what they never became, to say nothing of what they never were. Why will the paparazzi after them? If there was no money, if there was no money in the photographs, they wouldn't have been after her in the tunnel. On the very first morning of the morning, it was plain that the crowd on the Mall had more than grief on its mind. Indeed, there were elements of mob feeling, as well as elements of demagogy, in play. We'll be back with much more from London, but first, this is today, I'm going to see. I have reasons of my own for remembering this feverish moment. Mr. Hitchens, I know that you contend that Princess Diana basked in the media spotlight and, in fact, encouraged much of this publicity. Can you, can you elaborate on that? Um, Princess Diana was a volunteer member of a very controversial ruling dynasty. Uh, for a brief time. Um, and in that capacity, she deserved and, in fact, I think necessitated uh, a lot of scrutiny. She was also someone who was an assiduous tabloid leaker. It's not the fault of any member of the journalistic profession that her driver went double the speed limit. You believe that the notion that the paparazzi somehow caused this is simply untrue? It's obviously it's self evidently untrue. Nobody can make a driver double the speed limit in, the, in Paris. I think it's a disgrace for Mr. Hitchens, effectively, to blame Princess Diana for her own death. Did nothing because of the kind. He was, of course, I did not nothing of the kind, Mr. Roberts. That's a very, I also that's think very that cheap. He that's extremely made, cheap. No, absolutely not, Mr. Hitchens. Didn't say it was her fault. I said it was the fault of the driver. If you're going at double the speed... Yeah, no, they were going twice. I, that, I, was, I, was, well, I, I saw that reliably said, and certainly the force of the collision seems to, seems to indicate tremendous velocity. Look, this is a non-issue. What we should be asking about is about what this does to the future of the monarchy.
People have always been magnetized by the actual spot on which celebrity tragedies occur, like the Grassy Knoll or the shrine to James Dean on Route 66. Here stands the memorial that is actually a replica of the flaming torch on the Statue of Liberty. The slogan on the statue reads, give me your tired, your hungry and your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Now it's been colonized and annexed as a rather tacky, improvised shrine to Our Lady of the Versace. It's France's latest tourist attraction. On the day of the funeral itself, there were observable signs of a photo album cult in formation. There's surely been an interval of sufficient decency for us to learn to distinguish the different types of mourning, which can be conveniently separated into categories. Those who just happened to be there and became part of a shared experience. It's just been a wonderful experience, really, to have been able to be here and share this with the English people. Those who felt they'd been given permission to grieve for an event in their own lives. Those who pegged their own past on her line. Those who lived vicariously through her life. I grew up with Diana, Princess Diana, having scratchbooks and um, coming from Namibia, Southwest Africa. It's like a fairy tale because we don't have princesses. Those who wanted to project their anger and find someone, indeed anyone, to blame. And finally, those who actually worshipped and idolised her and who may believe themselves to be actually in contact. We are all the way from Cameroon. I mean, in back home, everybody was touched. Exploring the different reactions to Diana's death, I began my journey in Wembley with Margaret Tyler, a member of that dying breed, the round-the-clock, uncritical royalist. Unlike Princess Diana, she even likes Prince Charles. Unlike Prince Charles, she adores Princess Diana. Hello, Christopher. Good morning. Nice to see you. Do nice come in. Happy. No, that's all right. This is where I live, Christopher, amongst all this royal memorabilia. Oh, and fantastic corgis. Yes, I had to have that one made. There she is. Yes. This one actually lights up, but this is from the royal wedding. Nice, isn't it? Well, the word radiant gets used, doesn't it? Yes. And this is your consecrated Diana room? Yes. Oh, yes. This carpet she's actually walked on. She has? Yes, it came from the Lanesborough Hotel and she has walked on it. And stained glass too? Yes. That took a lot of doing, actually. The face did, because I understand faces are very difficult in stained glass. Yeah. Slightly beaky. Yes, the, the green, just a little bit. Powerful green eyes. Yes. <laughs> and this must be one of the princes. Yes, this is Prince William. Yes, that's... Uh, in fact, the lady who made it, she said the Queen saw that um, and said if that had got a voice box, that would be William. Gosh. Yes. Splitting image slippers? Yes, yes. Obviously, I don't wear those now. I don't, you know, it doesn't seem right to wear those. But you used but to I wear used them. to, yes. I used to, but not anymore. It just doesn't seem quite right, does it? Your um, commitment to it seems very authentic. Yes. Did oh, you, yes, it goes back a long way. Did you doubt the sincerity of some of those who went around carrying on that week, then? Did you think of them as... Um... <laughs> What, sort of jumping on the wagon yes. or something like that. Um, well, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I mean, th people react in different ways, don't they? But they were they were united, I, um, I think, in their love of Diana. I mean, on the day of the funeral, you tell me somebody who didn't watch the funeral. Uh, you know, there weren't many around, were there? Well, how would you know that? Well, it, I mean, they were just... They certainly everything. didn't... There were certainly no shots of people not attending the funeral. No, no, no. I mean... And no, there was no, no coverage of people with television switched off. No, no, but I mean, you just knew that even people went on holiday or something, they still watched it in the country they were in, whether it was in a foreign language or not, because they, I think they wanted to be part of it or they wanted to see a little bit of it or they wanted a little bit of her still. But I don't think many people didn't see it. What's your impression of a group of people you haven't met, you know, namely the sort of people who are entirely unmoved? What sort of people do you imagine them to be? Very cold, I think. I think anybody who, who couldn't be moved by that isn't going to be moved by anything very much. And if people didn't want to watch it, then perhaps they're not in the real world. Perhaps they're out of touch or something. I really... I wouldn't mind meeting somebody and asking them, actually, you know, what did you do on that day? Did you sort of just carry on as though it were normal while the rest of the world was mourning? There is another Britain which was there before the Windsors and will be there after they've gone. This Britain is deceptively mild and understated, but it refuses to be impressed by mere spectacle or overwhelmed by gusts of fashion. It prides itself on not panicking. It is not cold or inhuman, which is why it is not swept away by demagogues, superstars or messiahs. 
Travelling up and down the supposedly United Kingdom, I found it easy to find and meet examples of this other Britain. Brendan Martin from East London wrote a letter contrasting the press coverage given to Diana with a Guardian story about the death of 400 wretched black Haitians buried at the bottom of page 12. He felt that Britain was being brainwashed. I certainly didn't grieve about Diana's death. It would have been absurd for me to grieve about her death. I'd never met her. Insofar as I knew her, I knew her through the media. How can you grieve somebody that you've never met, that you don't know? It's presumptuous and it is, it is I think, offensive. Um, you can grieve somebody who has made a very big difference to your life. Uh, I dare say that South Africa will grieve mightily as most of the world will when Nelson Mandela dies. That will be a grief about somebody who has made a huge difference in the world. But I've never met anybody who could say to me, Diana changed the world in which we live and that's why I'm grieving her. People are expressing their grief right across the country. And it's all testimony to how a young woman won the affection of the entire nation. The BBC got it into its head that there was something called a national mood. And not only that there was such a mood, but they decided what the content of that mood was. What the media were essentially saying was, we all feel like this, don't we? And what I said to myself was, no, I don't. When people turned out and watched the funeral, they were sharing in a national experience. People want to share in experiences like their football team winning the league. This was an opportunity for feeling connected with the rest of your society. But what we were having here was that the price for inclusiveness was this is how you must feel, this is how you must think. And that's kind of sinister and I think rather obscene. At the beginning, the mood was light, it was jolly, and over you know, the last couple of hours, it's really changed dramatically. Everyone is just so struck with grief. Many people assumed that everyone felt the same way, but this was not the case. Even though some call-in and feedback shows would not allow profane thoughts on the air that week, a few voices did seep through. This is Talk Radio, the conversation of the nation. Some people might just want to watch Coronation Street. I'd like to see Coronation Street tonight. It might sound selfish, but I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I just don't think it's on. I can't believe people are discussing this the way it is. I mean, she was a silly, trivial woman. You're, you're making her into something that she just wasn't. What and she not, is at the moment, Liz, is dead. Not everybody is interested in the royal family. You know, what, what, what's the nation coming to? I can't believe that people are, are taking this as a personal sorrow. We don't know the woman. She's, she's not like somebody you knew, you know. Would you read what you've said on the card? Well, I've said the card. It's not just what you've done for us that makes us love you so. It's all the joy of who you are that frankly comes to know. Same. Surely there's a distinction between grieving for those you know and those you only think you know. Elizabeth Stern, a reflective musician in South London, had serious thoughts of her own about grief and believed that she knew the real thing when she saw it. I was on the tube and I saw quite a few women, they were all women, um, standing with big bunches of flowers with some um, little cards that were addressed to Diana. And I couldn't understand what they were doing. I couldn't identify with them. And you had a personal reason to relate to the idea of grief? Yes, I did, in that um, my parents were killed in a car accident abroad. So that's as near to a comparable experience as you'd be likely to get. Anyone who suffered a bereavement like me will know. Um, bereavement and mourning is a long-term process that goes on, I think, for the rest of your life, if it's someone that you love and you're close to. These fields of flowers are spreading. Florists are running out of stocks and more blooms are being flown in from Israel. There's also the distinction to be made that people do not send condolence cards, teddies and flowers to the person who's actually died. Um, we received a huge amount of condolence cards and flowers, but they were all addressed to us and to the family and not to my parents. We didn't receive a single card that was addressed to my parents and I just thought it very strange if we had them. I just cannot think that people who thought they were mourning over Diana can possibly say that they were grieving in a way that I understand grief 
and I don't think they were suffering bereavement in the way I suffered a bereavement. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they were suffering, but I'm very sure about that. I didn't really follow much about her in life, but her death has hit me. I can't explain it. <laughs> there were those who felt that they had been given, so to speak, official permission to grieve. It had not before been acceptable to emote in public, and all of a sudden, it was the done thing. Then came those who felt that they had milestones of life in common with the departed, often women who believed that they had shared with her in certain rites of passage. And let's not forget the vindictive, those who sought hoarsely and angrily for someone, indeed anyone, to blame. The man, for example, who assaulted a foreign visitor to these shores for the grave offence of lifting a sacred teddy bear. There are also those who become fascinated by celebrity culture, an addiction that may not be as harmless and silly as it looks, including as it does the habit of vicariously leading other people's lives. One affectation of this cult is the familiar adoption of the adored or famous person's nickname, Gaza, OJ, Diana, or even until her death, Di. What about those who were attracted by mass events and crowd spectacles, including many tourists? People were kicking the paparazzi one minute, but lining up in their thousands to take pictures of the coffin with their instamatics and videos the next. So with the help of a little reflection and examination, it becomes evident that that famous throng of mourners was by no means as unanimous or as monolithic as its media cheerleader would have had you, perhaps I should say us, believe. And come to think of it, why did so many people from day one decide to deliver their posies and bouquets and teddy bears to the wrong address, to Buckingham Palace? It seems to have taken the grief-stricken a little time to accept that their heroine was no longer a member of the royal family, wasn't even an HRH, had in fact been paid a queen's ransom to get lost. As the procession passes by, there are outbursts of emotion, but mostly a hush falls over the crowd, everyone consumed by this extraordinary yet tragic piece of history. The press and the broadcasting apparatus, fully conscious of its sovereign role, turned itself into a megaphone, an echo chamber, a feedback loop, a machinery for positive reinforcement. And the more coverage it supplied, the less its critical faculties were engaged. More meant worse, and more meant less. At least part of this explanation has to do with media coverage, with a cowardly attempt to preempt an anti-media campaign disguised as populism. This is a motive somewhat less than compassionate. As a result, all the mourners were reported as not they, but we. Not them, but us. Even by trying to make distinctions and discriminations between different types of grief, authenticity, and spontaneity, we are at least attempting the task that our mass media so signally failed to perform or even to attempt. People are expressing their grief right across the country. It's now just an hour until the funeral cortege sets off. People seem reluctant to go straight home. So why and how did the media choose to become a monotone voice for this so-called national mood? Venturing east into the pastures of Essex, I made my way to meet Simon Heffer, a conservative pundit for the Daily Mail, who, having previously written about the princess in a rather disobliging way, was told to take that week off, the better to clear further space for eulogy. My dear Mr. Heffer, I think. Good to see you. Nice to have you. I had written some very hostile pieces about the Princess of Wales before she died. And uh, it was deemed, and I'm sure it was commercially the right idea, that uh, my views uh, should be kept um, in their place, which was not in the paper for that time. How would you rate the performance of our great profession in this? Many hacks would now cite the Nuremberg defence and say, I was only obeying orders. They wrote things that looking back on them a year later in their yellow and cuttings books, they will not be very proud of. I think the order that went out that week on all newspapers, more or less, 
was that the Princess of Wales was a very popular figure, that in her sudden and tragic death, she had uh, been elevated to a posthumous popularity, not seen, I suppose, by anybody in this country, in the history of this country. And therefore, any newspaper that wished to retain circulation had to be pretty nice about her. And reality was suspended. And so uh, many hacks who wrote about this had no choice but to write about her in a very reverential way. I think, to an extent, the, the event in history that preceded this was the Hillsborough disaster. And we remember that when the Sun newspaper famously said that the Hillsborough disaster had been caused by a bunch of drunken Liverpool supporters fighting their way into the ground, uh, its sales slumped, and it had to issue a grovelling apology before a lot of newsagents would stock it again in the, in the Liverpool area. And I think that that created a great fear of public opinion. Do you believe that the loss of the Princess of Wales was a gain for the lasting credibility of monarchy or diminishment of it? I believe that the royal family's uh, chances of survival intact for another generation were greatly improved by the death of the Princess of Wales. Because I think the longer she had stayed around, the more of a liability she was going to become to them. I think that uh, if she had married into uh, the Fayed family, our royal family would have become a laughing stock very, very quickly. And uh, it would have been a blow from which it would have been very hard for it to recover. There were a few in the media who didn't agree to suspend reality. They were made to pay a price. In Soho, I called on my old friend Francis Ween, whose columns are a regular antidote to whatever tripe happens to be flavour of the month, and who also helps to put out Private Eye, a resolutely bullshit-free magazine which was withdrawn by newsagents during Diana Week. Readers were ringing in saying, we can't get it, it's been taken off sale at WH Smith. So we got on to the chief news buyer and she said, uh, yes, yes, I think this issue ought to be banned. Um, we have a policy of not selling any newspapers or magazines which include the crashed Mercedes. And we said, well, um, we haven't got it. And she said, yes, you have, on the cover. We said, no, there's a picture of Buckingham Palace with a crowd outside. And she said, yes, but in the bubbles, it mentions the crashed car. They're saying the papers are a disgrace. Yes, I couldn't get one either. Borrow mine, it's got a picture of the car. And on the strength of that, um, we were said to be bannable. And it took us about a week to get it back on sale at some of them. This was the state of mania that had taken over the news trade and possibly large part of the nation. And since then, the sales have gone up and up. People felt, oh, well, I think I might start buying this magazine. It's the only one that hasn't lost its marbles. Can you give us an idea of the sort of material you were publishing? Um, I've put together a resume of uh, the morning papers, the morning with a U in, uh, because already by Monday there was plenty to go on. Um, I think my favourite one was Linda Lee Potter, who um, the week before the death, 27th of August, had written in the Daily Mail, the sight of a paunchy playboy groping scantily dressed Diana must appall and humiliate Prince William. As a mother of two young sons, she ought to have more decorum and sense. And then, lo and behold, the uh, day after the death, Linda Lee Potter, Daily Mail, throughout their childhood, she gave her sons endless loving cuddles. She adored her children. Um, but there's an awful lot of it. I mean, the, the, even by Monday, candles in the wind were making an appearance. that moving number, Candle in the Wind. Except it's about England's rose, but she was a rose. And yet, somehow, it seems to me, you know your life like a candle in the wind, never fading with the sunset, as candles so often do, when the rain set in. So you have this candle, and it's been blown by the wind, and sunset comes, but it doesn't fade, even though the rain has set in. Rain always arrives at sunset, apparently. And your footsteps will always carry over England's greenest hills. The candle burned out. Long before. It's some um, gibberish, isn't it? It's doggerel, yes. <laughs> but, it's, National but, disgrace, but, it's, but it was some. Um, uh, it moved a lot of people, apparently, this some um, walking candle striding across the hills. In the form of a rose. At sunset. In the rain. Rain sodden. <laughs> Sounds like MacArthur Park. <laughs> <laughs> it's much worse than MacArthur Park. Hearing that with John, we were just crying. He was just well uncontrollable, listening to the words. The words were so appropriate for her. Paul Johnson in the Daily Mail wrote an extraordinary piece saying um, there are now two Britons, the new Britain of Diana and Tony Blair, the caring, loving, kind, gentle Britain, and there is decadent Britain of a few modern artists and limp-wristed Nancy boys and this sort of thing who are trying to revive the Oscar Wilde tradition. Um, obviously overlooking the fact that uh, the person who sang Candle in the Wind at her funeral was himself um, a bit of a Nance, and um, I think it's quite good to have 
football punch up now to get to remind us that we're not quite like that. The image of Diana as the caring princess who worked incessantly for charities and who, by her good works and her very public emotional struggles, won the hearts of the British people, has rarely been challenged. Those who did challenge that memory of Diana found themselves facing not only censorship but also physical abuse. Mark Thomas, a man who's proud to say that he does gags for money, was warned that week that a Diana joke was no laughing matter. To talk about Diana on the week that she died was to invite physical threat. Just the mention would immediately, you know, divide an audience. Did anyone try and shut you up? There were comics who were, who had censorship directly imposed upon them by the club owners. There's a chain of clubs run by John Glurs, and they phoned up the performers and said, we've had people who are coming to the shows who've booked saying they won't come if they're going to be jokes about Diana. So would you please not do any? They already know it's not funny. Yeah, no, no, that's right. There's, there's, no, no, we don't want it. I will not laugh and I'll walk out and I'll ask for my money back. And that was direct censorship. Can you think of any other time that's happened? No. No. It was almost like um, a Soviet leader had died and that they'd put on the martial music, except this, it was like images of Diana and her children. I was talking to a friend and said it had the logic of a Disney production and the enforcement of a Nazi state. And it was like Disney meets the black shirts. It's kind of like sentimental. You must cry. You will cry. Yes. I've always, you see, I love sort of like the idea of disrupting these events. And uh, one of the things that I... Oh, that's how... I just remember that. That's how I started the thing is about saying Princess Diana, I really wanted to go along to the funeral because um, I wanted to be the one to start the Mexican wave. Because people were actually in a state where they didn't know how to express mourning, and so they'd get a teddy. Masses of teddies and flowers. And, and delivered to the dead person, too. Yes, which was uh, remarkable. Absolutely incredible. I wonder if she got them all. And so because people didn't know how to express mourning, I'm sure if you actually started the Mexican wave, some people would have joined in. So I remember people saying she was a saint because she dealt with people who were HIV and uh, she worked with landmine victims and she did a lot of work for charity. And my point was very simple, which is if you are a millionaireess with nothing to do all day except contemplate throwing up your lunch, you might go out and think, fuck it, touch a leper, good PR. You know, the whole thing about comedy is that you say things which are beyond the pale, that you say things which you're not allowed to say, to go over the line. Uh, and to have freedom of speech. That is the whole point and purpose of it. Um, so when you actually, when you draw the line up and say, here is the line, you may not cross it, I think it's dreadful. If you're a comic and someone says, here is the line, do not go over it, you should gleefully bolt for it. Inclusiveness, that great term of the new age, is a treacherous concept. Society is not a family. Some marginal groups, recent immigrants, Gay men, single mothers among them, may have welcomed the chance to show how much a part of the community they are. But what is the value of such a warm community if it excludes or silences or even threatens those who think differently or think for themselves? You could have guessed, even on the day itself, that a relatively sparse crowd like this one was not the entire nation. In fact, 41% of Britain's TV sets were not even switched on. But the TV presenters couldn't deal with that information. For them, everybody was in the audience, and the audience, by definition, was participating. The other Britain was always, almost certainly, much bigger than anybody was allowed to know. But the other Britain need not justify itself by a head count. It's composed partly of Republicans, partly of those who are indifferent to the celeb culture, and partly of those who are set apart by reticence or reserve. Many of these may even have wished to grieve, but found themselves reluctant or unable to emote en masse. In the Deep England context of Morton in Marsh, I visited John Bradshaw, who had written a sensible letter to the Times at the height of the Diana frenzy, wondering what country he was living in. He received 87 replies, all of them in support. I was um, wondering if you can remember at what point you began to feel alienated or put off. As I recall, it was about by the Tuesday when the 
the media had been quite relentless and unswerving in um, their portrayal of events. And um, by Tuesday, it was, I remember the moment clearly, it was when they interviewed the mayor of Northampton. And I began to think that this was really absurd. They were, yes. with no disrespect whatsoever to the mayor of Northampton, I didn't give tuppence for his views, and I thought this had really gone on a bit too far. And no one of any contrasting opinion? No, no there was never one of any contrasting opinion at all. They made a, a sweeping assumption that everybody felt the same, which I, I felt improper. I was not part of that mood. I rather resented the fact that I, it was assumed that I was, and clearly so did lots of other people. And it just seemed to be going on too long, um, and I felt it was about time that it was pointed out it was too long and that it's our country too. Now, I've looked at some of your letters, with your permission, and we'll preserve the anonymity of the other correspondents, but a thing that was said by perhaps half of them was that um, they had felt afraid to express this opinion. Yes, yes. Does it strike you as odd that in England at this late stage of the century people should feel afraid to have an opinion of any kind? I think not only did I find it odd, I found it um, very worrying. I was quite shaken by that. They felt uh, out of touch with their country. Some of the letters were quite extreme, and it, it, it did provoke in me quite, quite strong feelings, I think. But you've seen um, a fair number of political phenomena in your time. Do you ever remember feeling before that you were living in a one-party state? No, nothing remotely like this. I, I, I don't want to see it again. I thought it was... Uh, I thought it was chilling. In the world of the High Street supermarket, I met Jill Rawlings, who had paid a stiff Diana tax for trying to keep her head. She wanted to keep the store open on the day of the funeral and donate all the profits to charity. And we couldn't bring her back, but we wanted to do something that continued to work. Make a contribution? Absolutely. Um, and we said that uh, it'd stay open and all profits would go to the charity. But then the wave of opinion seemed to be so strong and this is simply Wednesday evening by that stage, we decided that we would have to uh, change our minds and close. Uh, it really did feel a little bit like we had to conform with everybody else. We had to conform with this swathe of emotion. And yet there were still lots of people out there who did agree that what we were trying to do was right. We weren't trying to sell people anything. And yet on television every night I saw all these flowers, beautiful flowers, but how much did the totality of all of that cost? I didn't see anyone donating that money. I couldn't reconcile the two. Did you feel um, menaced or was anybody threatening or was it just abuse? It was a wide uh, amount of emotion ranged from people who were very upset um, and they felt that perhaps our decision was not right and they, they were expressing great sadness, great emotion. But you didn't get people saying It'll be a brick through the window or a petrol bomb or anything like that. Well, we did, we did have one threat in, in one store, but um, I'm sure if, when the day came that uh, they would have had better judgment. Suppose public opinion caused more than just supermarkets to abandon their charitable plans. Journeying over the Scottish border, I headed towards Balmoral, where, apparently against public opinion, the royal family had wished to remain at the time of Diana's death. Prince William and Prince Harry themselves wanted to be with their father and their grandparents at this time in the quiet haven of Balmoral. Here, in the most loyal and royal part of Deeside, festooned with cabers and sporans, hard by Balmoral itself, I met William Neston. This staunch Highlander, chairman of the Braemar Games, had found the pressure from the Diana fanatics too much to handle. Her death caused the only peacetime cancellation in 180 years. The events overtook us, and really we were left with no option but to cancel the gathering. What form did the pressure take? Pressure took uh, really abusive phone calls. Unfortunately, the majority of the, the abusive phone calls were directed towards my wife, who was answering the phone that day. And really, it was vitriolic phone calls. Terrible. Before we cancelled the gathering, the majority was largely against the, the event taking place. The moment we cancelled it, of course, the majority was uh, that the gathering should have continued as, no as normal. Now, the Highlanders did not run at Culloden, didn't run at Waterloo, didn't run on the Somme, didn't run in North Africa. Are you seriously saying that they ran because of a media-generated public opinion? I think, uh, yeah, the media had a large... Uh, portion of, I would say, blame 
So, uh, charity missed a bit of a chance then this time? Very much so. I mean, a portion of our profits go to charity. We actually lost £30,000 last year in getting everything organised uh, for nothing. But this is an area with quite a strong link to the royal family, is it not? Very much so. At that time, of course, the royal family were in residence at Balmoral. The local people felt that the Queen was certainly in the best place at that point in time because the children could be in a nice quiet spot. They were away from the hubbub of London. And I mean, she is our Queen after all as well. So, into which category of mourner did the royal family fall? Having been very nearly brought low by the antics of two hyperactive Sloan Rangers and their boyfriends, the Windsors found themselves attacked, first by populists, demanding the hauling down of a standard that is normally never struck, for it represents the people through their crown, and despised by the traditionalists for an easy surrender to mob opinion. And all of this in the name of an us that was a mere construct. The dignity that was lost that week can never be regained. There was even one moment when an obeisance was made to a pretender. On behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men. So By flaunting the chief point about himself, his heredity, Charles Spencer mounted a mock Shakespearean challenge to the legitimacy of the House of Windsor. The challenge may not have been real, but it was a week when anything synthetic was guaranteed hysterical applause. For a supposedly serious and grown-up country, to submit itself to being lectured by a spoiled and pampered lordling is something embarrassing to recall even now. But does it make any more sense to regard the fount of all goodness as being some mystic Lady Bountiful or fairy godmother? Isn't there in fact an element of infantile regression in all this, with every mourner thinking it was all about him or all about her? Where was I when I heard the ghastly news? Who cares? A servile, unanimous media provides the perfect environment for an opportunist politician. And with the wall-to-wall -wall insistence that a nation mourns, the way lay open for those who love nothing better than giving the impression that they speak for us all. Tony Blair appears to know this by instinct, by annexing that tabloid phrase, the people's princess, from Julie Burchill. He contrived, at least by association, to give the impression that he was the people's prime minister. At least he did it with some panache. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain. Blair had a very good week, coming impartially to the aid of both the Windsor and the Spencer dynasties, while baptizing his own new ministry from the pulpit of Westminster Abbey in a reading from St. Paul to the Corinthians. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. The new, updated, user-friendly version that substitutes the word love for the word charity. Every celebrity these days needs a charity, preferably one with a signature illness attached. Perhaps you remember Camilla Parker Bowles being compelled to cancel the osteoporosis ball during the frenzy of Diana Week. Diana's great achievement was to make the whole celebrity charity biz seem genuine. And perhaps that's why so many people, ironically in view of the fact that money is what charity most needs, are so shy and so reticent about appearing to raise anything so vulgar as money in her name. Yes, I was so charitable in her life. I thought it was sort of appropriate while I'm standing here, I can make a little blanket for baby. Charity as a concept combines the old idea of the fairy godmother and the deserving poor with two contrasting modern ideas. The first being compassion and the second, rather less compassionate, being the notion that voluntary and not government or taxpayer effort should support the needy. A lot of moral and ethical confusion here, to say the least. After a divorce settlement that would have looked breathtaking, even in Beverly Hills, the fairy tale princess left exactly nothing to charity in her will, preferring to redistribute a fortune among the country's two or three wealthiest families. The loyalty of those who visit her shrine was not mirrored by Diana, whose brother revealed that her last wish was to cease living in Britain at all. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. 
My old friend, Anthony Holden, became a convinced Republican as a result of his brilliant career as a royal biographer and actually knew the princess. He still believes that her fans were Democrats at heart. Where would we be now if traffic or alcohol conditions had been better in Paris on the last day of August? I'm glad we're not getting into conspiracy theories about that accident in the tunnel. Had the princess lived, I think she would have done Britain proud on the world stage, leaving the Windsors looking like a bit of a rump, a bit of a relic of a post-imperial Britain that does not exist anymore. And this in spite of the fact that she would have been the consort of the son of a rather dubious Egyptian grocer? There was a lot of xenophobia in the courage of that relationship. Uh, perhaps a hint of it in your question. There was not going to be a Fide dynasty. Dodi was a summer fling, and I hope she had a great fling. He didn't have enough brains for Diana. He had enough money to give her a good time, not a good enough security system to keep her alive, unfortunately. <clears throat> Now we're coming to the morning of her death, right. and you watch the crowd build up outside Buckingham Palace. By the Sunday lunchtime, what was fascinating to me was if you got there, you looked around, everywhere there were flags, 360 degrees at half-mast, except on the palace. And I was broadcasting to America and attempting to explain that the flag never flies when the monarch's not there, the flag never flies at half-mast, etc. But I thought on this occasion an exception might be made to this crusty old cobwebbed crap. And people listening behind me started saying, yes, Mr. Holden, dead right, you're right, right on, you're a man of the people, say that on the BBC. And it became a kind of national movement, and by the Thursday there was a flag on that flagpole. So you're in part the author of the Show Us You Care, Ma'am movement? Certainly I was. Um, the Express did do a story in slight fear and trembling, thinking I was exaggerating a bit, saying public getting angry with the Queen, unless something happens, the Queen will be booed on Saturday at the funeral, and if Prince Charles strays more than 10 yards from his children, who of course are in tacti, uh, he will get rotten tomatoes thrown at him. I don't think, I don't think that they're the most cold people on this earth. And if I could actually speak, see them and speak to them, I would just really tell them what I thought. In fact, I would probably be passing away in the town forever. One aspect of the Windsor's absence from the national life that week, which got people so worked up, was the fact that they don't show their emotion in public, whatever they're feeling in private. A couple of months later, we saw them all blubbing their eyes out over a hulk of metal. When Britannia was decommissioned, in a way that they hadn't over the princess that they were claiming in death was the best thing about the monarchy. But if you want a, a republic <coughs> of um, citizens and not subjects, isn't it a strange baptism? to have a week in which the moral tutors of the nation are Mohammed al-Fayed and Earl Spencer. Spencer's speech in the Abbey, I would go so far as to say one of the great political speeches of the 20th century. At that moment, he symbolized what that crowd had been feeling all week outside the palace. Uh, the extraordinarily symbolic thing of the applause outside the Abbey, unlike the Elton John song, creeping inside the Abbey, creeping down the sides, moving to the middle, to the point where even poor William and Harry too young to understand what was happening, grief-stricken, of course, applauded because they thought they ought to, while their father and grandparents sat fixedly ahead, and that was the moment the Queen was looking the end of the monarchy slap bang in the face. People have said to me, if that week had happened under the dying days of the John Major government, we would not have a monarchy anymore. But it was Blair to the rescue. She will do whatever Blair tells her to, that's already become quite clear. If Blair had not ridden to the monarchy's rescue, Earl Spencer would by now be the first president of the British Republic. One year on, and some people can't seem to let go. Efforts to create an apt or fitting memorial seem to strain for effect, and yet only achieve the pathetic or grotesque. Some say we should ruin Kensington Gardens, an enclave for generations of London children. Others favour a five-pound coin, with the Queen on one side and the Princess on the other. Her Majesty's expression in this case is likely to be somewhat fixed, she never thought they were two sides of the same coin. Talk about being two-faced. This is the last part of the route to Althorpe through villages in Northamptonshire where Diana is still remembered as a young girl who came home for the holidays. Now she's being welcomed back for the last time. Even though she had preferred bright lights and big cities, the rural setting of Althorpe, sometimes pronounced Altrup by the Toffs, was thought most appropriate for Diana's last resting place. Ironically, her brother denied her the use of the estate when she still needed a refuge. Here, 
in this abruptly consecrated, thatch-infested hamlet, I passed an agreeable morning with an unlikely skeptic, Captain James Bellamy, late of the 8th Hussars. Tell me as a local how you recall the week that was. We, in fact, were totally and utterly overrun. I couldn't get out of my house. Uh, there were hundreds, thousands probably, of media here. Really, they were terribly intrusive. They were searching for that which did not exist. Here in Northamptonshire is her place, and we're here to welcome her home today. Lady Diana didn't come here very often. She was only here as a girl, and so we saw very little of her, and, and you can't spin uh, news out of nothing. And you've had people coming straight from the airport to Orthorpe? Yes. On Sunday evening, for instance, there were some Americans who'd hired a taxi who'd come out and were just photographing the gates. I mean, it seems pretty mindless, but I suppose it gives you a sense of having been there, you know. We do encounter uh, occasional dramatic emotionalism there. We have a girl who's been here with flowers every day since the 1st of September 1997 and still comes. It is, is upsetting because I, I just feel that people have got it wrong. Cast the runes, if you will, for the future of Thorthorpe. We hope it's not going to change us immeasurably because we've been here for a long time. But the, the facts are that Lord Spencer's decided to sell 150,000 or thereabouts tickets uh, for visiting Althorpe. This means that we're going to have something of the order of 800 to 1,000 cars um, coming during the day. And of course, over lunchtime, I think there'll be a sort of crash point about it. Um, I would think that the interest in Princess Diana is likely to continue at a fairly high level for certainly a large part of this generation. But I think like all things which haven't got, if you like, a particular spiritual significance, I think that it will gradually fade and the village will survive. Althorpe was in the process of being engulfed by pop modernity. The croonings of Sir Cliff and Chris de Burr transforming it from a slumbering bucolic idyll into the raucous equivalent of a Woodstock for suburbanites, or a Graceland shrine, perhaps, with a suggestion of a pilgrimage thrown in. Earl Spencer had just claimed, loudly and indignantly, that he would never make money from his sister's death. He didn't seem intent on losing any, either. Just come through Harleston, it's uh, taken three quarters of an hour to do just under two miles, which is pretty pathetic. Hi! <laughs> come to see me. If it keeps going, we'll just have to open the champagne, drink it in the car. We'll have to walk three Probably miles drink. to get out of our taxi. Three miles and away. Walk. We'll have to stop in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> the concert is controversial enough, but it only represents the beginning of what's becoming a Diana commemorative season. That'll run from now through the anniversary of her death at the end of August. She was young, she was blonde, she was funny and photogenic, she was attractive to adults and loved by children, and she had that energy on behalf of others that you read about much more often than you meet in real life. The wasteful and thoughtless cruelty of landmines, for instance, was more than she could bear. Yet when Jodie Williams received the Nobel Prize for Peace for her years of effort in the cause of banning landmines, she remained in the wasteland of anonymity in which non-celebrities belong. Nobody knows who Jodie Williams is. But is there anybody who does not know that Diana, Princess of Wales, once spent a few days in Bosnia and Angola? The notion of an icon or a role model is an essentially futile one, because it holds up an ideal that by definition is unattainable. As a result, we encourage the worship of a mere human being and the hysteria that's inseparable from it. The word fan, we do well to remember, derives from fanatic. Can it be that we actually prefer the imitation to the authentic, the dream to the responsibility of a conscious life? Golden girls and boys all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. The golden princess has gone and she's not coming back. Emotional surrogates like Louise Woodward turn out to be unsatisfying. And golden boy, Prince William, may grow stale as his father has in the gloomy wait for the winds of succession. Of course, we do have an alternative. It's summed up in the injunction, get a life.
So, very interesting take on Diana, Princess of Wales. Now, keep it with three this Friday night as we've something completely different after the break. It's our gripping Friday night movie. Adam Brody and Meg Ryan star in the land of women after the break. <laughs>